This incident occurred in Ozona, Texas in the summer of 2015. I had been on the phone with my ex-boyfriend, but I had fallen asleep. Then I suddenly woke up because I could hear my ex-boyfriend saying, Baby, please don't do this. I believe that I had broken up with him while I was sleep talking to him. Anyway, he was telling me I was saying ugly things to him. In the middle of our conversation, I hear wings flapping and see a large shadow stop at my window. The first thing that runs through my mind is La Lechisa. I tell my ex not to hang up, but not to say anything. I'm scared, and I don't explain anything to him. Then all of a sudden, the shadow disappears. I then start telling my ex what happened, when from the ceiling of my room, I hear this horrible laugh and scratching. Then I try to yell and nothing comes out. I am frozen scared. I try to yell, I try to get up, but I can't. Somehow I finally jump off my bed and run across to where my cousin and her daughters are asleep. I try to wake up my cousin so I touch her and she opens her eyes. I said, there's a lechuza. But she didn't understand me. She said, what? Pretty loud. The girls woke up and right, then it's right above my cousin's room. The girls start to cry. I'm starting to freak the heck out. We don't know what to do. My cousin and I decide to call the cops and tell them that we saw someone looking in the window. I mean what would they think if we said, we need an officer to rid us of this lechuza. Anyway, we call them and I swear the scratching, laughing and thuds are loud and getting louder. We wait and literally seconds before we see the spotlight from the cops outside. It stops. The cop arrives, but they soon leave. About 10 minutes after he leaves it comes back. We run to the car and decide to leave. That was the last day I lived with my cousin. About 10 years ago, there was four of us walking through the woods local to us. To get to the best entrance to the woods you have to walk through a crematorium. There was me, Thomas, Lisa, and Alice, and we had planned to go camping in the woods. We had been camping in these woods on many occasions. I had a very easygoing mum, so the parents of the other three would call my mum to ask if we was having a sleep over at my house. My mum been nice said yes. We were all 13 at the time. We was walking through the woods to where we normally camped, and on the way there we walked past a man with an axe. He didn't speak just stared us out. We walked on and just brushed it off. The night went on as you would expect. Having fun trying to drink and not be sick and just have a laugh with friends. We went in the tent to go to sleep about 3 a.m. About 20 minutes later we heard what sounded like trees been axed down. The sound echoed around the woods and made us all alert. This went on for about five minutes, then as soon as it stated it finished. Thomas joked about the man with the axe and Alice got rather upset with him. Time had passed, and just as we were about to go to sleep we heard footsteps. They were circling around our tent. We all sat up in shock and started to, to panic. We heard logs of wood been dropped outside our tent. We could feel the wood as it struck the floor. We gained the courage to look out of the tent and as well peered out. He was there, sat on the floor staring into the tent as we opened it. We all bailed and ran as fast as we could from them woods. All this time we never heard him talk. Ten years on none of us have ever stepped foot near them woods again. This was probably six or seven years ago that this happened, but I do often think about it. So one day I was just having a little me time before work and felt like running inside this fast food place to sit down and have lunch. 
As I'm in line waiting to order an older man around 50s or 60s, I'm like 23 or 24 mind, he walks up kinda close and starts chatting, asking me what my fave dessert was at that restaurant. I was being nice and said I like the chocolate cake. Then he asks if I'm from around here, to which I just nodded and said yeah. He stated he lived way out in the woods, and I just nodded and kind of started to ignore him while it was my turn to order. I ordered my food, and it came up quickly, so I took my tray to a table by a window. I had forgotten about the guy at this point and got up to get condiments and stuff. When I got back to my seat, I saw that he was at the table just in front of me facing towards me just staring at me with his food in front of him. I got a bad vibe and moved to the other side of my table so I wouldn't have to face it. I then realized I forgot to get something at the condiment area and got up to go over there. As I foolishly walked past the creepy man's table, he looked up at me and said, You don't have to sit alone, you know. I looked at him and said, I'm fine, I want to be alone, and continued to get what I was getting. When I walked back I went around the other way so I didn't go past his table again. I ate quickly not even sure I finished cause I was just weirded out. I could feel him just staring at the back of my head at this point. So I just got my tray and got up to throw it away and leave. As I walked past his table again had to walk past to get to the garbage cans he looked up and creepily smiled and said, Hey well it was nice to meet ya. Yeah. And I just threw a dirty look and walked quickly away. I left and kinda sprinted to my car to make sure he wasn't following me. I mean maybe his intentions weren't bad, but I kept getting a weird vibe. I think about it often. Like maybe he was genuinely looking for someone to chat with. I was just looking to eat and chill without being bothered, so maybe I could have been too rude. So there I was, stationed in Afghanistan during the years of 2011 and 2012. It was a tense time, as we constantly monitored the predator feeds, eagerly anticipating the start of our shift and the missions that lay ahead. Little did I know that this particular day would bring forth a series of events that would leave us all in awe and disbelief. As we watched the feeds, our attention was immediately captured by the sight of a motorcycle speeding through the rugged Afghan terrain. It carried three individuals, one of whom had a bag over their head, facing backward. Instantly, a wave of concern washed over us, as we realized we were witnessing a kidnapping unfold right before our eyes. We braced ourselves, fearing the worst witnessing a fellow human being meet a tragic end. The motorcycle came to a halt near a cluster of trees, breaking the illusion of Afghanistan as a desert landscape perpetuated by the media. The captors led the hooded figure out of their sight, and he was forced to kneel on the ground. Time seemed to slow down as we anxiously awaited the next moments, filled with dread and helplessness. But to our astonishment, instead of carrying out a gruesome act, the captors unexpectedly lifted the hooded man back onto the bike. Confusion mingled with relief as we watched them speed towards the nearest town, our anticipation mounting. As they arrived in the heart of the town, our anxiety peaked once more. The motorcycle screeched to a halt, and the captors pushed the man against a wall. What could their intentions be? Our minds raced with speculation, fearing the worst. Then, something utterly unexpected unfolded before our eyes. A seemingly ordinary ice cream cart was pushed into view. The captors removed the hood, revealing the face of the kidnapped man. To our amazement, they handed him the ice cream cart, transforming him from a victim to an unexpected purveyor of frozen treats. As if scripted, the once captive man began moving through the town selling ice cream to the locals. Confusion swept through our ranks, mirroring the disbelief we felt within ourselves. 
The situation had taken a surreal turn, leaving us questioning our assumptions and perceptions of the world around us. It was another one of my bear hunting adventures, and I had just finished cleaning a massive black bear I had taken down. The sun was beginning to set, casting an eerie glow over the dense forest. The air was thick with the earthy scent of pine and anticipation. As I meticulously prepared the bear, my ears caught a distant sound. It started as a low, haunting howl that echoed through the trees. The hair on the back of my neck stood on end, and a shiver ran down my spine. Timber wolves. Their mournful cries seemed to fill the entire forest, sending a chilling sensation down my spine. Just as I was about to shake off the uneasiness and pack up my gear, something caught my eye. Glancing at the trail camera I had set up earlier, my heart skipped a beat. There it was, a chilling image captured by the camera. The timber wolf stood tall and proud, its eyes shining with an untamed wildness. But that wasn't all. Right beside it, standing on two legs like a bipedal creature, was a dogman. The sight sent a surge of fear through me, as if something primal within me recognized the danger. The dogman's presence, so close to where I had been just 20 minutes ago, made my skin crawl. It was an encounter that defied explanation, leaving me unnerved and filled with a mixture of curiosity and dread. It was a crisp autumn morning, and I found myself scouting a riverbank alongside my brother-in-law, eager to discover potential duck hunting spots. The sun's golden rays filtered through the trees, casting a warm glow on the surrounding landscape. Little did I know that this peaceful excursion would soon take an unexpected turn. As we ventured deeper into the wilderness, our eyes scanning the horizon for signs of waterfowl, we began to notice peculiar markings on the ground bare sign. A mix of excitement and caution filled the air, for black bears were known to be elusive creatures. Yet curiosity propelled us forward, and we pressed on, hoping to catch a glimpse of one of these magnificent creatures. It wasn't long before our attention was drawn to a nearby oxbow a potential haven for ducks. Anxious to assess its suitability as a hunting spot, we cautiously made our way towards it. However, our eagerness soon gave way to astonishment and a primal sense of fear. Standing about 50 to 60 yards away, in all its towering glory, was the biggest black Bigfoot I had ever personally laid eyes upon. Its presence was awe-inspiring, and I couldn't help but feel a mixture of wonder and trepidation. Time seemed to stand still as we locked eyes with this enigmatic creature. Sensing our presence, the Bigfoot appeared nonchalant, showing no overt interest in our company. Yet an unspoken understanding passed between us. We were unarmed, vulnerable in the face of such raw power. Had it chosen to close the distance, it could have done so with ease, the realization sent a chill down my spine. In that moment, we knew that our best course of action was to retreat slowly, step by cautious step, without turning our backs. Our hearts raced as we walked in reverse, our eyes never leaving the formidable figure before us. The Bigfoot, seemingly unbothered by our presence, remained stationary, a silent sentinel observing our retreat. Finally, with a mix of relief and gratitude, we reached a safe distance. The creature made no attempt to pursue us, choosing instead to vanish into the dense forest. It was a surreal encounter. In 2002, I had just responded to a call outside of Glendale, Rhode Island. We were called to the area because a hunter had been chased by what he believed was a large bat humanoid. Its face and eyes looked like a ball about two inches across, very bright, 
and seemed to be grinning at him with sharp teeth. The wings did not flap, but somehow glided away from the man, who was still standing in amazement at what he just saw. It flew off into the trees and never came back out. I searched for over an hour, trying to find this creature without success. I heard no other sightings since then either. There is a bit of hunting that goes on in the area throughout the year. Officer B, who will remain anonymous for this report, indicates that it wasn't something that could have easily been explained. They are very hesitant to share their full encounter due to ridicule. However, Officer B did describe the creature and did not indicate that it seemed to be something that could have easily been misidentified as any known animal. Officer B also indicated that there was a constant stream of hunters in this area during the time of the search, but no other reports were noted for this specific area. At the time, Officer B did state that they had heard stories from other officers regarding strange sightings and experiences with various large bat-like creatures all around Glendale, Rhode Island over the course of several years dating back prior to 2002. Of note, Officer B has indicated that they are considered by some members of law enforcement as reliable witnesses due to their hard-earned reputation for truth, reporting of facts associated with their profession. This creature's sighting remains unexplained. Officer B stated that they have seen other reports in the area and has indicated similar sightings in the general area, though no other locations in Glendale match these reports. There's also a note that a man by the name of John Burglary was doing some work in a cemetery in Glendale. He claims to have seen a large creature in one section of the cemetery back in 1984. He described it as demonic tall black with large wings. He claimed that it flew directly over his head and believed it came from a portal from hell. He equates its size to be roughly eight feet tall if standing. Though this report isn't specific to Glendale, I did extensive research for any type of flying humanoid report from all around the area, and only three, including Officer B's sightings, popped up. All other similar sightings I located were across the country, not limited to southern New England. Officer B later sent me an email indicating that there have been other strange incidents prior to their own sighting. Two years previously, a local youth had been severely mauled by something he described as a big hairy thing with wings. No other reports came out from the area regarding the incident, and the boy was never interviewed or heard from again. Although I think a large part of that is the media jumping in to shut that down before the public got word and began to mass panic. Officer B indicated that it appeared to them that law enforcement was trying their best not to mention the incident to the public. At one point or another, government officials had stepped in and took control over the case. Officer B had also contacted me later, indicating that they had also spoken to a retired officer who said they were involved in an incident where one of their colleagues was attacked by something very large and unidentified. This was after responding to a call in the same general vicinity. This is likely what led them to investigate further when they received the initial hunter's report. I'm aware of several areas across New England and the world that have, on occasion, had incidents like these. There's usually some kind of game or animal to blame. Though what is described by Officer B doesn't appear to be anything like an owl or other known species of flying animal. As always, I welcome any further information regarding this type of report. If you have experienced similar events, feel free to contact me. I am also looking for input from individuals who are interested in real research and would enjoy being involved with a group working together on finding explanations for currently unexplained mysteries across New England and beyond. Officer B, whose name will be kept confidential to protect their employment and identity status, also indicated that immediately following the sightings, there had been government officials reporting the same thing.
documented as looking like a big person with wings. Other than a few hunters who claim they've seen something large and unidentified flying around at night, nothing has been said about the incident. It is assumed that law enforcement will follow up with further investigation if they can confirm something was actually sighted that evening near Glendale. But since we are relying largely on bureaucracy, I wouldn't hold my breath. I remember that day like it was yesterday. It was the early days of the US invasion of Afghanistan, a time when the world held its breath in the aftermath of the Twin T attacks. Our mission was clear. Root out the Taliban, obliterate Al-Qaeda, and bring justice to those who had caused such immense suffering on American soil. I was part of an elite special forces team, a group of men handpicked for their courage, resilience, and unwavering dedication to the mission. Our journey had led us deep into the heart of Kandahar, a place as unforgiving as it was rugged. The terrain was unlike anything we had ever encountered before, a stark contrast to the familiar training grounds back in the States. We weren't alone in this hostile land. Our local Afghan allies, who had no shortage of bravery, stood with us in the face of an unrelenting enemy. We had engaged in fierce battles against the Taliban, each firefight testing our mettle and resolve. But there was one encounter during our time in Kandahar that still haunts my dreams to this day, an encounter that defied all logic and explanation. It happened one eerie night when the moon hung low in the sky, casting eerie shadows upon the barren landscape. Our team had established a temporary camp, our weary bodies yearning for some rest before the next operation. As I lay on my cot, my senses on high alert, I heard whispers among my comrades about something unnatural lurking in the darkness. The tension in the air was palpable as we grabbed our weapons and moved cautiously through the moonlit night. It wasn't long before we saw it, a ghastly figure emerging from the Inkai blackness of the Afghan night. It was taller than the pickup by easily a couple of feet. Its grotesque form was like something out of a nightmare. Its skeletal frame was surrounded by an impenetrable darkness, a void that seemed to absorb every trace of light. Long, sinewy arms hung at its sides, as if in a mocking challenge, as if it was saying, try and hit me. We were not the type to back down from a threat, but this was unlike anything we had ever encountered. The creature was three-dimensional, with an aura of malevolence that chilled us to our very core. Its face, or what passed for one, was a haunting deer skull, devoid of any warmth or humanity. Fear gripped us, but we were trained to analyze, to assess the situation. It was a futile effort. Before we could react, the creature lunged at us with a horrifying speed, its long arms outstretched like the grasp of death itself. Panic set in, and we opened fire, our weapons unleashing a storm of bullets. The night erupted into chaos as the creature hissed and shrieked, its unearthly wails sending shivers down our spines. The firefight was intense, our adrenaline-fueled hearts pounding in our chests as we fought for our lives against this abomination from the depths of darkness. In the end, the creature managed to evade us, disappearing into the treacherous Afghan mountains, leaving us shaken and bewildered. We stared at each other, a mixture of disbelief and terror etched onto our faces. As we regrouped and tended to our wounded, we couldn't help but wonder what we had encountered that fateful night. Was it some supernatural entity? A product of the fear and exhaustion that gripped us in the desolate wilderness? Or had we stumbled upon a hidden facet of this ancient land, a mystery that would forever haunt our memories? One thing was certain we had entered Kandahar as soldiers, but we left as witnesses to the inexplicable. The shadows of that night would linger long after we had departed that unforgiving land, 
a reminder that some secrets are best left buried in the rugged terrain of Afghanistan. I work for a security company. We install CCTV on construction sites. One night about 2 a.m., our response officer gets a call from the monitoring station to say there's a guy walking around one of the buildings under construction. They described him as tall, dressed in all black with his hood up, but couldn't see his face because he had his back to the camera. He wasn't stealing or vandalizing, just wandering around, usually homeless looking for shelter. So the response goes to investigate. When he gets there, there's nobody around. So he asks the station to check the camera covering the only way in or out of the building to see which direction he went. Nothing. He does a full patrol of the site and there's no trace of anyone. The only other way for this guy to get out was to shimmy down the scaffolding and he could be hurt so the officer asks the station to do a check on all of the camera footage through the night. Nothing. The next day we asked the station to send over the stills from when they initially picked the intruder up. He's not on any of them. Just footage of our response officer waking around. We were pretty freaked out talking about it in the office, and it was laughed off as the monitoring officer being sleepy and seeing things, except the cameras we use have IR beams, and they only alert the monitoring station when someone breaks them. It was a 2 a.m. type late on a Friday night after a party. Me and her both 18 are at the local state park admiring the moonlight and each other's private parts at the lakeside. I hear slow calculated footsteps behind us. The kind of slow that makes you think someone is trying to hide their approach. I don't remember if it was crunchy leaves or what that gave them away, but I'm just glad I turned around. I look back and see two shadow figures were there, coming towards us from the road and maybe 50 yards away. My car was behind them, and we are definitely the only people in the entire park at this time late at night. I stand up and I say out loud something like, guys, what's up? They don't respond, but keep moving towards us until I say to them with a little more tension, stop moving. They stop maybe 30 feet from us and are a little more visible now. One's got a tank top and camo pants, the other has full camo pants and jacket, and what I'm pretty sure was a black paintball mask. Tank top guy starts with, hey guys sorry we didn't mean to scare you, then says they were just noticing my car parked there illegally and that cops ticket all the time here at night. So I said thank you for letting us know. But then they didn't move. Awkward silence. I said, great thank you. Again and still nothing except Tank Top tried to talk about parking tickets again. I noticed Paintball Mask had his hands stuffed in his jacket pockets. So I thought it was time to ask him to remove them. Another awkward silence. Of course he didn't. So I asked him again. Another silence. He finally removed them, and that was it. The guys walked away and kind of just disappeared into the woods. We ran to our car spooked and couldn't stop checking in the rear view mirror the whole way out of the park. We checked the computer when we got home and find out all kinds of complaints were being made there about assaults on couples at night. In the 80s there was a serial murderer on couples there too who'd never been caught all around spooky, and until now I have unnecessary laser focus hearing behind me at night. Fifteen years ago, I went camping with two school friends in Bushland that backed onto my dad's property in Warri Yalik, Australia. My dad didn't spend much time at the house, but said we could use it as a base to dump any gear we might not need. He also gave me a heads up that he might creep up to our campsite that night and scare the guys I was with. 
We hiked from the house for about four hours through very dense bush, where we found a clearing and decided to set up our camp. Looking around the place for firewood, we kept turning up a lot of old bones, some so old they almost looked like wood. We concluded that due to the land once being used for farming, it was likely they were cow bones. We came up with a few more theories for the sake of scaring each other, then built our fire, even burning a couple of the wood like bones, just to see what would happen and settled in. I was woken up by one of my buddies at about 1am who said he swears he saw torchlight on the tent wall. Excellent, I thought. We sat in silence for a few minutes before the light came back. This was great. I really handed up, making up stories about murders in the area and escaped prisoners. The light from the torch fixed on our tent, then switched off. We could hear leaves and sticks moving around outside and my buddies were on the verge of tears. Then we started hearing whispering outside, as well as some low mumbling. Dad had brought some friends in on the prank, dedicated. The torch light came back on and pressed right up to the tent wall, and a hand began tapping across the top while the whispering continued. My dad had brought some friends in on the prank and convinced them to walk four hours through dense scrub in the middle of the night just to shine a torch on our tent. I started to panic. Then it just stopped completely, about an hour after it began. We sat in total silence aside from the sobbing of my buddies, and at dawn packed up and got the F out. We got back to the house and Dad was there. He apologized and said he'd planned to come out and see us last night, but fell asleep at his girlfriend's house. We told him about what happened, and he was genuinely dumbfounded. Interestingly, I went back to the spot a couple of years ago after telling this story to a friend. We found a small shack made of corrugated iron pockmarked with bullet holes, a 44-gallon drum full of burned clothes, a pile of firewood, and two axes. Who knows if it's related, but it was creepy. Spent a week with a Shuar family in the Amazon about 15 miles from Chone, Ecuador. Little background. Three of us gringo medical pre-medical students were staying with them on a medical education rotation, learning about traditional remedies. It was a blast. We stayed in a, in a separate shelter from the family, and the walls of our shelter was decorated with giant snakeskins and tiger skins those beasts that had wandered too close to camp over the years. The jungle is a loud place to sleep. Millions of animals and insects clamor all night long, and it blends into a sort of peaceful cacophony. After the gunshot rang out at 3 a.m., the cacophony was gone. Absolute silence. It was the scariest sound I had ever heard. We clung to my two and knife telling ourselves that it would protect us from whatever was coming. We cowered across from the entrance to our shelter awaiting what was to come certain a tiger was lurking, or that our lovely hosts had decided they were sick of us. We sat and shivered through the night. The silence was terrifying. When the sun rose, and we finally felt confident enough to venture outside, it turned out an unlucky capybara wandered through camp during the night. Poor little bugger got shot in the face at 3 a.m., and was the first meat we had eaten all week by 7 a.m. Tasted like greasy venison. I'll never forget that night or that lovely family.